Good morning and welcome to the Light on Suitability podcast. I'm your host, Elizabeth Camo, with my guest host, Daryl, Sean, Michelle Garfinkel. And we have a special guest today, a friend of Sean and Daryl's, Joaquin. And Joaquin is going to talk to you about his journey. Perhaps, um, Sean, would you like to do some introductions and then turn it over to Joaquin to share his story? Yes, this is Joaquin Jordan. Um, he was my mentor. He's the guy who snatched me off the, the prison yards and pulled me by my little bald head. Got me in there to see things differently, to see life differently. Trained me to become a facilitator. Honestly, if it wasn't for God using him, I wouldn't be home today. And so I'm very thankful. I'm glad that he's on the show. I'll just turn it over to him. Joaquin. Man, that was a powerful introduction. Thank you. <laughs> you, you throw people in the water on your podcast. It's like, <laughs> so yeah, that's cool. No, thank you. We know you, you so... can swim. Uh, what'd you say, Michelle? We know you can swim. You're not a sinker. <laughs> to to quote um, one of my most inspirational why don't you tell us what you, um, how you came to prison to begin with and right. your journey to where you sit today? Like a min like many people like who look like me and who grew up in places like me, I think um, growing up in Los Angeles in the 80s, mid, I'm a 70s baby, but with the emergence of cocaine and the enormous amount of money in our in, that came from our community, it was, for me, uh, a big issue around masculinity and male performance. And so I thought like being a man really consisted only about how many girls I could get and how tough I was perceived to be. And so that's a heavy lift when you're a kid who has severe self-esteem issues, who have been bullied extensively, so for me, it was just like uh, Lemony Snicket book, a series of unfortunate events, because I thought I was going to be a drug dealer. I quickly became addicted to cocaine, crack cocaine. I ended up in the juvenile system. And my entry into the juvenile system was because, you know, my mom reached out to the police department because I was a kid to play Pop Warner football. I was always in sports, pretty good student. And, you know, she reached out to the cops, you know, LAPD. At that time, the solution was lock kids up in juvenile hall. And L.A. had a huge juvenile justice system. Um, East Lake, Kirby Center, Silmar, LP, Los Padrinos. So I ended up going through placement, cap, eventually committed to the youth authority, maxed out of the youth authority two years before I ended up in state prison with a 12-year um, prison sentence. Stayed out 45 days after serving six years, relapsed, and earned a life sentence, a three-strike sentence. And so what I realized in looking back is the treatment models at the time and the juvenile justice models at the time, they were what they were. Like, we didn't have any understanding of the impact of powerful psychomotor stimulants on juvenile brains. We had, like, very small understanding about the neurobiology of addiction. You know, and at that time, the, the belief was if you lost brain cells, um, they were gone forever. And so just looking at, looking back um, on the treatment models, I can see where I consistently fell through the cracks because the one thing that I did not get as a juvenile was really comprehensive treatment for my addiction. And so my addiction sustained my criminality. So the only solution at the time was just continue placements in correctional facilities in juvenile facilities. And so basically all of those interventions were me basically just doing time. There were some activities, you know, I always went to school when I was inside, but I did not get, you know, comprehensive uh, treatment to deal with my addiction. Subsequently, just, you know, that same old story, doing a life sentence on an installment plan until I actually earned a life sentence. And that was where I started my change in 2005. Um, I had a instructor and she was interviewing me because I had completed her office services and related technologies class, which basically 
talks you how to use computers, uh, Microsoft Office Suite. So I completed her class and she was interviewing me for her TA spot, her teacher's assistant spot. And she asked me, she said, so what are you going to do with the rest of your life? And I said, well, when I get out, and she said, well, let me stop you. You have a life sentence. You might die in prison. Like, what are you going to do with the rest of your life that you're living right now? And so I was like super offended. Like, who's this little white lady, you know, confronting me with the finality of my prison term? So I call myself storming out the room. But when you in a, a level three yard, there's not a lot of places to storm to. So I got up, aggressively walked to the door, you know, waited for the CO to do the unlock aggressively walked down the hallway to work change, you know, stripped out, put my clothes back on. Then I stormed out of work change, went back to my, my housing unit. But when I got back there, I thought about it and I didn't have an answer because I had always believed that my life was on hold during my, my periods of incarceration. And so, and that was significant because I had already spent almost half of my life in jail thinking about the way that I was framing my life, I hadn't lived any life since I was like 14. So I went back to, to the class and I told her, like, I don't know, I don't have an answer. And she said, okay, that's an answer. We'll figure it out. And we just carried that question. And every time she would do something, like um, she was really insistent on doing life skill programming and behavioral uh, change programming in her vocational class. So we would have regular curriculum, but um, the supplemental curriculum was always either anger management, um, effective communication. Um, we started victim impact, problem solving, all these things, all these different groups she would run. Oh, and she was also a licensed therapist at that time, going to school for her um, doctorate in psychology. But a huge thing for me was this was a person who just accepted me as I was, um, thought I had a lot of potential. And... I really wanted to be connected to her. And in prison, you know, uh, relationships are heavily regulated and structured. And so through this relationship, I, it really taught me how to get the most out of um, intimate relationships that did not meet the definition of intimacy that I was familiar with. So for me growing up, intimacy was always this thing um, rooted in physicality, right? You know, either sex, or girlfriend, boyfriend, some type of relationship, I really didn't understand how these heterosocial relationships can have a lot of intimacy, but were pl either pl strictly platonic or just like um, instructional, like in a mentorship. So I really wanted to be connected to her. So I had to change my behavior. You know, I had to start going to group. Um, I had to stop drinking on the yard, you know, like all these different things in order for me to keep up appearances because, you know, everyone always talked to um, Ms. B, Dr. Barbara. So for me, I had to do this radical change in my behavior. And, and fortunately, the tools that I needed to create that change, to affect that change, I was learning in her groups. So it really was a matter of me applying the things that I was learning in her groups in order to stay affiliated with her. And so I just continued, you know, I went to every group. I started going to NA, um, AA, um, but the, the group that was the most significant for me was a restorative justice-based victim impact program because it really gave me an opportunity to challenge my beliefs around um, my crimes. I had always um, stated, and I believe that I hadn't hurt my victims because I hadn't physically put my hands on someone. But anyone who's ever been robbed or anyone who's ever committed a robbery knows the only way that you can successfully complete a robbery is you have to put that person in fear. And so within this, this program, I really um, became exposed to um, the concept of empathy. Had no idea, you know, and when I think back on it, I'm like, how did I go over 30 years of my life without understanding conceptually or practically the word empathy, like as I think about it now, like decades, and this was not even in my lexicon. You know, now it's a part of my life. It revolves around the way that I interact with my clients, um, the way that I see the world. And so just thinking back that, you know, I lived a lifetime 
without any understanding of this word. And so this program gave me an understanding of empathy, taught me what it looked like, allowed me to be responsive to it. So it was life changing. You know, I never wanted to um, make people feel the way I have felt when I've been robbed or the way that I know my victims felt. This spurred me writing letters to all my victims. Um, I, I sent them to my DA, the prosecuting attorney. Um, he got them to all my victims. So that was a huge thing. I remember getting a letter back um, <laughs> from the LA County District Attorney. And so I, there were a lot of robberies that I had not been um, convicted for. So I was like watching the clock on the statute of limitations, like it was homeroom. Like, so I'm like count the days. I'm like, all right, I know that one is going to expire in like six months. So I, I got this letter and I was like, holy smoly, man. They getting ready to tell me they go come and rearrest me, right? They got an open case. And I opened up the letter and it was a letter from my prosecuting attorney. He said, hey, you know, uh, sorry for taking so long to get back to you. I distributed all your letters to your victims. Um, glad to see you're changing your life. Keep up the good work. And I was floored. And that really um, reinforced the path that I was on with regards to changing. So um, inside, when I was at, at the at my housing location, um, started a number of groups, got involved in a counseling training program, earned four college degrees, AA degrees, two vocational certificates, no, three vocational certificates, um, and just really tried to figure out how to find some meaning and purpose um, in, in, in my location. And I think like, you know, there was a time and I think everyone who has a life sentence and who changes their life comes upon this, this space where I was committed to not going back to where I had been, you know, mentally and emotionally, but the finality of my prison term was weighing on me. So like processing that, man, I may never get out of this place. There's nothing I can do um, to get out of this place. That is a heavy weight, but it's a weight that is essential to lifting in order to like move into this new space, this new emotional and mental space around meaning making and perspective taking. And so for me, it was it was tough because I like um, was contemplating suicide. And for probably a month, I had made a deal with myself that if I didn't get to run one day, like run, because that's that's what I did in prison. Like now was part of my recovery was running. And, and the deal I made with myself was if I didn't get to run, I would kill myself, right? Like if the universe wanted me to stay around, then I would only hang out if I could run every day. And, you know, in prison, the, the likelihood of having 30 days with no program modification is like low, right? Like, you know, if you go 30 days without a lockdown or some type of modification to yard because of training, right? You having a banner day. And so during this 30 day period where the deal I had negotiated with the universe was, if I don't get to run, I'm not leaving the cell. I'm going to kill myself that day because I'm tired. I'm going to transition. I had made it okay. And we had had a cluster of suicides um, that quarter. We had like four suicides. And so the not the weird thing, but what was significant to me, and I think anyone that's done a, a long period of time, you get why people kill themselves, right? There's never any question where it's like, oh my God, why did he do it? Like whenever you would hear about somebody kill, killing themselves, you're like, yeah, that checks out. I'm going to hang around a little bit more, but it's like, you get it. There's no stretching the imagination. You know, you have so much to live for, right? That takes a lot of work to find things to live for on, on five square acres, like, which is the size of a prison yard, uh, at least a 270 yard. And so during this cluster of suicides, you know, I got this, this crazy macabre deal with the universe, not one program modification, not one lockdown, not one yard open every day. And so I realized, right, I, I had a really good clinician, too, at that time. And so I was processing this because I was scared to share this with mental health because the policy at that time was if you um, articulated a suicidal ideation, you were going to the ad say, right? Let's go lock you up, strip you out, put you in a rubber room. That, that's the paradox, right? Like you're ready to die, but you don't want an alteration to your program, right? It's like this weird, like 
juxtaposition of, of this existential angst, right? Like, I'm I'm tired of this life, right? But I need to go to canteen. So it's like you don't want to do anything that's going to jeopardize that. Um, but I, I talked to my clinician, and what I came up with, what I realized was me committing suicide was just an extension of my forced behavior, like this need for expedience, this refusal to um, defend in place. And I realized that all the victims of my crime had to live with what I did every day. They didn't get a chance to say, I'm tired of this. You know, so I felt like a part of my um, amends making was to live. Like I had to live with the knowledge of what I had done and I had to live with the pain of incarceration. Those were the consequences of my behavior. And so that was the deal I, I kind of came to. I was like, okay, if I'm truly committed to this transformation, right? If I'm truly committed to this lifestyle, then I have to de defend in place. I got to do this time. I got to do every day of it. And I got to do it in a way that is respectful and honors the trauma that I created. I, I just, at that point, I just made up my mind. I was like, okay, I'm all in. I'm going to stay here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I got to do. And, you know, I love to read. And, and I had read this. My mom had sent me this book. And it said, suffering is effort laced with negative emotion. And so I was like, all right. If, if doing time is effortful, then the only thing I can control is how I feel about it. Like that was powerful for me. It was like a superpower. I was like, man, I can control how I feel about stuff. And then it hit me. Oh my God, I'm responsible for how I feel about stuff. You know, so there's this thing where it's like, yes, I get to do this, but also, oh, I'm responsible for that. So it, that was like my guiding principle that I get to choose how I feel about something or how I experience a situation. I just felt like, okay, I'm going to live as fully as possible in the place I'm at. I am going to work hard. I'm going to actualize all my potential. I'm going to have the best quality of life possible on these five acres. And that's what I did. And one, one of the things I, I tell, because I work with a lot of clients now still in prison and system impacted, is what you do with your free time in prison is, is what you're going to do with your liberty. Like prison is so structured. How do you spend your, your free time? Are you hanging out with your buddies, drinking? Or are you going to group? Are you doing homework? Are you working on like independent stuff, you know, study stuff, stuff that's going to enrich the quality of your life no matter where you are? And so I found that all the things that I did in my free time, I'm doing now. And that really um, assisted in my transition because the only thing that changed was my location. Still go to groups, um, still in school. I'm working on my last semester of my master's degree at Chico State. I um, still work two jobs. I worked a lot when I was in prison. The only thing that changed was my address. And so that was really, really important with regards to the the my mind catching up with my behind when I paroled because I I still had all the same momentum from my work ethic so it was easy to carry that over and and it, it carried over and so like I'm really fortunate to have had the opportunity to grow with people because I realized change doesn't happen in a vacuum like especially under those circumstances so it is the communities that we create wherever we are that are going to facilitate or hinder change. Robbing stores, uh, creating victims, being a teenage crack addict, like all of those things were like horrible to be. So really like understanding that there was a difference between me and my core self and my behavior. Like, you know, my core self was unchanged, good, wholesome, loving, joyful, but I had put all these layers on it with addiction and criminality. Yeah, it, it, it was powerful. It was powerful for me. That's like the Cliff Notes version of, of my change. That was That's excellent. Like excellent, Joaquin. So excellent. Could you explain how do you change your feelings? Like when you were describing about your mom sent you the book, I think, and it was about you know, I call it the, you know, it could be the pity party or anything right. like that. But if you put something positive behind your effort, that's going to go great. If you put something negative behind effort, it's not going to be great. It's going to feel like you're suffering. 
and you said that you were responsible for your feelings. So then when you started to feel negative, then what? Like, how did you make that shift in your emotions? How do you, how does that one, how does somebody go about doing that? Deliberately and intentionally. And so at that time I, I was in therapy and um, DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy, basically a CBT um, informed mindfulness intervention. But it really was about self-talk, like what you tell yourself and this over-identification with the feeling. And so for me, that was my thing was like taking everything so personally and, and realizing that in order for me to feel different, I have to think different because you only have access through your emotional content, through your cognition. And so for me, like learning that was super important that what I said to myself and what I said about things really determined how I experienced things. And once I saw that like happening, I was like, oh, so it really was just a matter of, of being deliberate in doing that and, and repeating that and creating that habit. And, and like, I love neurobiology, so I could talk forever about what brain change looks like and how when you engage in these processes, you know, the myelination processes is, is triggered and then you know, you're creating neural pathways and, and Hebb's law about neurons that fire together, wire together, like all these things. But the short answer was self-talk. What I said to myself was so important. What I said about a situation was so important. I couldn't change the facts, right? But the lens in which I looked at it was super key. Um, and, and learning that and being instructed in that was, it was a game changer. Like it was even now. And so you, you see what's real and what's not. And a lot of the stuff out here is make believe. Like this entire existence is make believe. But you really see like the stuff that people focus on. You choose to focus on that. Like if you're giving your attention to that and that attention is through a perspective of lack, you're going to feel that. And it's going to unpack that way for you. So yeah, to the, the short answer is, what I said to myself about me, what I said to myself about my environment, and what I said to myself about the people on it, like that that was key. And, and it's so funny, Mon's here. One of the things he would say is like when we hold on to these resentments, when people who it's like you drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. Like that was so instructive for me because I literally would go around resenting like all day. That that was entertainment. Watch Seinfeld and hate on somebody. Really realizes like, oh man, this person don't care two hoops about me, but I'm literally carrying this person around in my head rent free. So yeah, it was self talk. Self talk is is so important and fixing your face. As I was changing, one of the things I I always said was, you know, I I, I don't want to make amends with people for things I say to people, right? So I don't want to be verbally mean but I would have a shitty face all the time, right? And so, you know, you don't have to say nothing when your face is all jacked up. So for me too, like really being mindful of what my nonverbal communication was, um, was was really, really important. So yeah, self-talk and is, is key it, with regards to shifting the way you are viewing your experience.